Welcome to the Medical Equipment Donations Webinar. This webinar is presented jointly by the Clinical Engineering Society of Ontario and the Canadian Medical and Biological Engineering Society. My name is Bill Gentles. My co-presenters are Sarah Kelso and Murat Farat. This slide shows a brief outline of the webinar. First, we'll start with introductions. Then there'll be a poll question. We'll ask the audience for some input. Um, um, we'll discuss briefly the issues with donations, then show a brief video produced by CMPES that um, gives a brief outline of the uh, issues around donations. We'll talk about the new CMBES guidance document on donations. Murat will give a brief presentation on the Ontario Surplus Hospital Equipment Network. And then we'll have about 10 minutes for questions and discussion. Peter, can you um, send out the poll question to the audience and we'll give them a couple of minutes to answer. So the questions are, what types of equipment have you donated recently? And you can check all that's apply. It's a multiple choice question. Um, we just put on the list the most common things, um, but if you've donated a lot of equipment that's not on the list, you might put it in the chat for us just to help, but check off anything that um, you've been involved in uh, donations of in the past year or so. And we'll give a couple of minutes for people to answer that, and then we'll look at a summary of the results. See some comments here? <laughs> None, not in good enough condition. Fridges and freezers. Yes. Incubators. in the process of donating Prismaflex and RO water treatment systems for dialysis. But some people are saying they have not donated. Just one house housekeeping issue. Um, we'll be having a Q&A at certain times, so you can ask your questions then. Yeah, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, you can ask questions in the chat, but we're able to manage them better if you put them in the Q&A uh, feature rather than the chat feature of Zoom. Thanks. Only some patient monitor accessories, like pulse oximeter probes, or I think, Martin. Okay, do you think we've got some data, Peter? We could display the results. Yep, we do. I'll display it in a second. Okay, so the most common, that's not surprising, actually, the most common is beds, followed by patient monitors, infusion pumps, ultrasound machines small number of x-ray units, and some dialysis units, but a lot of other, as we saw in the comments. Anyway, that's that's most interesting, and um, perhaps um, it'll raise some questions as we talk some more about the, um, the, the pitfalls of making equipment donations to low-resource countries. Okay, moving right along onto the next slide. Um, See if I can get this to change slides. Okay. <clears throat> so just some of the sources we're uh, using for information to um, present in this webinar. There's um, three key documents. The first is a med uh, WHO medical device technical series document called Medical Device Donations, Considerations for Solicitation and Provision. This is available on the WHO website 
Um, I'm going to put the link to that in the chat. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, okay. That's a link directly to this document. It's a PDF document, and it'll allow you to download it. It's a very useful document, but I keep an eye on the WHO website because they're in the in the middle of updating this document. In 2023, there'll be a new edition that uh, deals with um, deals a bit more with um, recipient responsibilities in equipment donations. Second thing we are going to be uh, using as an information resource is a study that was conducted um, by the International Outreach Committee of CMBES between 2015 and 2017, in which we um, surveyed 41 donation organizations across Canada to um, inquire about their donation practices. We also looked, um, we hired a research assistant in Ghana to interview uh, representatives of 28 healthcare institutions in Ghana to talk about their experiences in receiving equipment donations, not all from Canada, but uh, from many countries around the world. And the third document, um, which we'll talk more about a bit later, is the new CMBES guidance document on donations. So just let's talk about the need, first of all. Uh, this is uh, a statistic that's published in the WHO document that in some countries, nearly 80% of the healthcare equipment is donated or funded by international donors or foreign governments. In, in low resource countries, the budget for healthcare is extremely small and High-tech equipment is simply beyond the reach of, of the finances of, of healthcare systems in lower resource countries. So they're extremely dependent on equipment donations from um, organizations that do charitable work around the world and also wealthier countries that have surplus medical equipment. So there's an urgent need for donated medical equipment. Um, but the problem is, According to one estimate, um, and this varies depending on who's donating and who's receiving it, but only 10 to 30% of donated equipment actually becomes operational in developing countries. And we'll talk about the reasons for this, but it, it's, um, it's a rather troubling statistic that indicates that there's a very high failure rate in the um, donation activity around the world. And, many people are not managing the equipment donation process properly. As a result of which, they're placing an undue burden on these low resource countries by sending them equipment that they can't use, and it ends up in equipment graveyards. We'll show you some pictures of those a bit later. Um, goes to landfill sites in the low resource countries. So we've spent all of that energy, all of that funds, loading up shipping containers, sending them halfway around the world, getting them to a healthcare institution that can't use the equipment. If all of the money spent on those logistics were just donated to that country, they'd be much farther ahead in their healthcare system. So there's a, an extremely important incentive for people to get this right, because otherwise you're placing, instead of helping, you're placing an undue burden on the recipient country. So the problems with equipment donations, um, in our study, as I said, we looked at 41 organizations, um, both registered and non-registered charity, NGOs, not-for-profits, non medical clinics, and hospitals. And we looked also at the recipients in 28 hospitals in Ghana to get an understanding of their experiences. So just to summarize some of those results, for many Canadian donor organizations, there is great room for improvement. And these are just some of the following areas. A lack of formalized procedures. So they don't have standard operating procedures. They don't have anything written down. It's all uh, done on the seat of the pants. 
nobody can pass on to others if they leave the organization what the best practices are that they've developed during their tenure in the organization. Nothing's written down. That's a common problem in small charities where everybody thinks they're doing some good work from the goodness of their heart and they shouldn't have to do all these bureaucratic formalities. Second problem, testing equipment. Make sure the equipment's working before you send it off. Make sure it's got all the necessary accessories so that it can be put into use. Third problem, providing additional support for the recipients in the form of manuals, spare parts, and training. Because this equipment is going into, a, in many cases, an extremely hostile environment. There may be no air conditioning, and it's a very hot country. It may be dusty. The users may be poorly trained and unfamiliar with the equipment. And so there's a very high failure rate of donated equipment that goes to low resource countries. So it's essential that user manuals be provided with the equipment. And it's almost equally important that maintenance manuals be provided as well, because in one of the small um, studies we did, we followed a container load of equipment to a low resource country. After about a year, 50% of the equipment that was functional when it arrived was out of service. And the reasons were lack of spare parts, mostly but also lack of training. People didn't know how to fix it when it broke. And the final um, shortcoming of many donor organizations is the lack of a long-term monitoring process to follow up with the recipient country and see if the donated items uh, met the needs, if they're still working, if they've had problems keeping them working, if they've run out of accessories or spare parts, the feedback every time you make a donation is an essential part of that donation process. And so just talking about briefly about the recipients, the most common challenges faced by the recipients were a lack of spare parts and a lack of operating or service manuals. In some of these countries, if a patient cable uh, comes apart or breaks and they need to replace it, there's no distributor for that manufacturer in the country. Maybe in Europe, it might take months for them to get a replacement for a patient cable. So it's important to send as much in the way of accessories as is possible. Now, as the next item on the agenda, we're going to show um, a brief video that talks about best practices in um, donating equipment. Right, so I'm just going to see if I can start the video. It'll just take about seven minutes. One day there was this 12-year-old boy named Moses uh, that I made friends with. He was admitted to the male ward. He was one of these cases that uh, on the third day after the staff had actually reported that he was getting better and his condition was stabilizing, uh, he died three hours later after I left the hospital. There was some internal bleeding the staff was aware of, and they had no idea that his heart rate was rapidly increasing, his blood pressure was rapidly decreasing, and uh, he ended up dying. And I went back in the next day, and I found out, and I was pissed. <laughs> Because in my mind, I knew uh, without a doubt that he never would have died in the most basic facility in Canada. And so it became a human rights issue to me, it became a social justice issue to me. Because what, by virtue of being born in that facility, in this community, does that justify and make it okay that he can die there when he never would have to die here? And the answer was no, of course not. So I saw basic diagnostic medical equipment as a way to address this issue and empower the staff to be able to provide care for their patients and save somebody like Moses. Kelly's story is not unlike the countless told by dedicated volunteers and organization leaders across Canada who have created special projects, charities, and nonprofits to address crucial medical equipment needs around the globe. To date, 
Canadian Goodwill has provided critical medical equipment to over 48 countries. From frontline equipment to more complex and larger devices, donations address everything from basic healthcare to supporting a healthy community, the value of which is considerable. This simplistic act of generosity is actually overwhelmingly complex, posing numerous hurdles that donors and recipients face to ensure equipment arrives safe and sound. So we do a lot of due diligence in equipment acquisition to ensure that we're only providing the medical equipment that has the durability and robustness to last and function for years at a time in the conditions in, in Northern Ghana that they'll find. Our primary sources are manufacturers and medical equipment charities that receive mass amounts of equipment donations from hospitals from manufacturers, and then they deal it out to the smaller charities. 85% of our equipment is brand new and unused, which is fantastic. The remaining 10 to 15% that isn't, if it's equipment that needs to be plugged in, that's slightly more comprehensive, like an oxygen concentrator, it has to be certified by a biomedical engineer that it has functionality to ensure that we're not providing something that will spoil when it goes over. Because equipment graveyards are a huge issue in resources. Process, often blockading hospital floors, creating landfills, and placing undue pressure on a system that is already heavily taxed. Too often, the majority of this charitable act goes to waste. Donating poorly functioning equipment at the outset is one of the reasons that donations can go awry. Research has shown that Canadian organizations often fail when it comes to inspecting equipment and checking for compatibility of electricity supply. When donations are received, few organizations ask for confirmation that the equipment arrived in working order or are provided status reports on the functionality of the equipment over time. Donating equipment that isn't truly needed can also lead to poor outcomes. I think it's immensely important to stick to the research that you've done. So even though we have offers of all types of items, sometimes expired, sometimes not, it's extremely important to still say, you know, these are the research items that we know are the most needed in our hospitals. And going away from that means you're gonna be providing things they don't really need, and they don't have a way again to safely dispose of. It's easy to fall into this top-down donor approach where you have a lot of sources of medical supplies and you're looking for a place to give them. And I don't find that's necessarily the most effective way because then sometimes you're projecting somebody's needs for them and that can create errors in the impact your project is gonna have. So with all this generosity and support to nations around the globe, how can Canadians improve? How can we strengthen a system that has tremendous impact on a person's health and a community's sustainability? Ideally, any donation initiative should be part of an ongoing partnership consisting of three core elements. Consultation, ensuring that the needs of the recipient are well understood and have been established through a consultation with all parties involved. Planning and process, having a clear donation plan identified and agreed to in advance by all stakeholders. Monitoring and follow-up. Perhaps the most important element is a sustained and supportive relationship with the recipient institution, ensuring long-term success and impact. I think it's important to work with a researcher if it's possible, because they'll just ask questions that maybe you're not used to thinking of. Um, and they'll keep you in check to ensure that the projects are meeting a sustainable end or are reflecting an expressed need that you're not targeting things and slipping into what's easy. Teaming yourself up with other individuals, other corporations that are critical and that are always gonna try to make your projects as strong as possible is always a sure bet to uh, success. For more guidance on all of the steps involved in an effective donation process, Several online resources are available, including the World Health Organization's guideline document and the Tropical Health Education Trust's Making It Work Toolkit. Because what starts as goodwill 
and a desire to make things better should ultimately create an equally promising outcome. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, great, thanks. The next item on our agenda is for me to tell you about the donations guidance document that CMBS has been working on. So first, a little background on the project. Uh, CMBS executive recognized the value of medical device donations done properly and the pitfall of poorly coordinated donations, as Bill has just told us about in detail, and we also saw it in the video. Uh, we also recognize there are regulatory requirements for donor hospitals that may not be well understood, and that many hospitals may be hesitant to engage in the donation process due to potential liability issues. And so the executive determined that it would serve CMBS members and the clinical engineering, biomedical engineering community well to address some of these information gaps. The work started with our professional affairs chair, which is a position on CMBS executive. Um, the key roles of that chair to address clinical engineering, biomedical engineering practice issues, uh, draft reference documents when um, applicable, coordinating the webinar series, uh, and overseeing other practice-related activities. And so the initial goal was to deliver a cl clear donation-related information to members via webinar. And we were hopeful to engage a representative from Health Canada to join us in that webinar and really offer some, uh, hopefully, clarity with respect to donation-related regulations. Uh, we still would like to do this, and hopefully it's an event that will come together in the future, but we just haven't made it happen yet. Um, around the same time, a former executive member offered to share some information collected by a clinical engineering intern regarding the regulations and liability surrounding medical equipment donations. So, of course, we accepted this generous offer, and this provided us with an excellent first draft of a document to work with. Our executive committee reviewed that document and updated it a number of times, but we really struggled to find the right tone um, and balance that would, was suitable for addressing all the different issues that we wanted to cover in the document. And we also found it difficult to make progress in that larger group setting. So we formed a smaller working group to set some objectives for the document, focus on each of the essential elements that we needed to cover review some of the finer regulatory details and address all of the feedback that we had collected up to that point. Um, it was interesting working in the small group because when we started, our different group members seemed to come with different perspectives that initially seemed like they might be competing perspectives, but in fact were just different critical elements that we needed to make sure made it into the final product. And I think we were successful. We've ended up with a document that's practical, balanced, and useful. And now we're looking to uh, forward to sharing it more broadly, starting with this webinar today. The title of the document is Guidance for Hospitals Donating Medical Devices. And the objectives are threefold to provide Canadian hospitals with information required to undertake medical device donations in a manner that provides the best possible value to donation recipients, is compliant with Canadian regulations, and minimizes donor liability. 
and I'll speak to each of these in a little more detail in the coming slides. Uh, the document is not intended to be legal advice or a position paper, but rather to support hospitals who are considering medical device donations by providing a summary of the relevant information that they should be aware of through the donation process. So the first element is the collaboration piece. Um, to ensure we are providing value to donation recipients, it's vital that the donor engage with the recipient to confirm that the devices to be donated will meet the needs of the recipient and that the recipient has the resources to operate and maintain the equipment. And we certainly have touched on the, these um, elements already. From a practical perspective, this means that the donor hospital, as much as possible, should include any supporting materials available in their shipment. This could be user or technical manuals or training guides, if available. Also including any remaining spare parts, parts or test sets that are required for maintaining the equipment. And from a clinical perspective, um, also donating any accessories or consumables that are available. A donor hospital might not know how to connect with a recipient organization, and there are third party groups that, that can help with this. There's organizations that can facilitate donations or facilitate connecting uh, donors with recipients, and we'll hear more about one of these uh, later in the webinar. As far as regulations go, there's two elements to the Canadian regulations that we need to be aware of. And the first one is the hospital taking on the role of a distributor. So many of us are aware that the sale of medical devices is regulated by Health Canada under the Canadian medical devices regulations. And Health Canada considers a donation as a sale without consideration. In fact, Health Canada considers any time a uh, device changes ownership as a sale, even if it doesn't look like a traditional sale. Uh, hospitals are actually exempt from the need to hold an establishment license, so we don't need to go through the application process to get an establishment license or play, pay the associated fees. However, hospitals still need to comply with the requirements of being a distributor. Um, and for the most part, this means keeping distribution records, which is essentially contact information for the future location of each donated device, sufficient that the hospital can forward any alert or recall information, or permit com complete and rapid withdrawal of the devices from the marketplace if required. Hospitals also have to have a complaint handling process sufficient to carry out an investigation into any problem that may be reported back to them from the donor um, organization. I'm sorry, from the recipient organization. The second part of the regulations that we need to pay attention to relative donations is active device licenses. So the regulations say no person shall import or sell, and now we know that sell, the definition of sell includes a donation, a class two, three, or four medical device, unless the manufacturer of that device holds a active medical device license um, for that device. And this can be an issue because sometimes devices that are uh, mature in their life cycle, um, the manufacturers will dis decide not to continue maintaining the active device license. Um, so if you are considering donating a device and you're not sure if it still holds an active devi device license, you can Google MDOL and you'll arrive at the Health Canada Medical Device Active License listing, sorry, Medical Device Active License listing, uh, which is a reasonably searchable database of all active medical device licenses. This requirement does not apply to class one devices, which never require a medical device license or donations intended for veterinary use only. And the final element that we cover in the guidance document is to minimize liability for the uh, donor organization. Most of the information that we have here comes from HIROC, uh, which is the Health Insurance Reciprocal of Canada. It's a not-for-profit healthcare safety advisor and the primary insurance provider for healthcare facilities across Canada. 
um, and they have a really good um, resource on their website where they provide detailed guidance for hospitals to minimize their liability when donating, which includes uh, complying with all Canadian regulatory requirements, which we've just covered, uh, and also providing de detailed documentation for each donated device. And uh, the list of what they think should or, or suggest should be included is quite um, extensive, including serial number, model, manufacturer, license status, history of all PM repairs, alerts and recalls, and corrective actions taken over the life of the device, all inspections, tests, and cleaning performed at the time of donation, and a statement of the condition of the device at the time of donation. They also strongly encourage the use of a liability waiver, uh, which is a document signed by the donor and the recipients intended to waive the rights of the device recipients to seek compensation from the donor if there are any future problems with the donated equipment. And in our guidance document, we actually have two tools in the appendices, uh, the first of which is a sample waiver document, uh, which uh, was based on a waiver document used by a Canadian hospital. And the second tool we have in the appendices is a donation checklist, which essentially covers all of the requirements that we've listed in the document, um, but in an abbreviated checklist form to hopefully facilitate consideration and compliance with the requirements. Also at the end of the document, there's an excellent reference section, which includes links to that HIROC document I just mentioned, uh, as well as the WHO document Bill mentioned previously, um, and some other good resources. Um, so in conclusion, uh, many of the factors that we've discussed today are going to help a hospital decide whether or not to engage in the donation process in addition to the hospital's own level of risk tolerance. Uh, what we wanted to do was provide ex uh, objective, factual information that hospitals can use to make the decision that best fits their organization. And if they decide to donate used medical equipment, to do so in a way that provides the best value to the donation recipients, is compliant with Canadian regulations, and minimizes donor liability. As far as next steps following this webinar, CMBS will share the full guidance document with CMBS members and CISO members by email, and will open a member review period of two weeks, uh, over which time we're happy to accept any uh, comments or feedback at our secretariat at cmbs.ca email. And then once we've had a chance to consider all of that feedback, we will publish the final document on the CMBS website. I do need to take a moment to acknowledge this group of people who made significant contributions to the development of the guidance document. Um, CMPS can't produce high quality materials like this without members stepping up and volunteering their time and expertise. So thank you and merci to all of them and all of you for your time and attention today. And now I'm going to pass the screen to Murat, who will tell us about the OCEAN initiative. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and I'm gonna be talking about um, the ocean on top of this very useful guidance document and the challenges. Um, ocean is, let me change the slide, okay. Um, ocean is short for Ontario Surplus Health Hospital Equipment Network. And uh, I wanna be clear, even though there is a word of Ontario in the title, there is currently no active collaboration with the Ontario government, unlike the Quebec, there is because uh, there is no centralized surplus, surplus hospital equipment coordination activity in Ontario. So CISO uh, thought there is a need and uh, OCEAN is a CISO project. And I will start first acknowledging the team behind the OCEAN. 
Um, the concept, the website, and the process was developed by a team of volunteers. Some group of same group of CISO volunteers are now running and maintaining the ocean since 2020. Adil Alam, Sajid Almaki, Murat Frat, Bill Gentles, and Timu, thank you for their help. Um, ocean has been a really low budget uh, initiative. Um, I think it cost us about uh, not including the volunteer time, hours of volunteer time, uh, about $100 to initiate. Uh, and now it's costing just the cost of website, running the website at the moment. Now, having said that, there hasn't been a, a very high volume activity, which I will talk about it later. So our mini poll results show that many of us get involved in donation of surplus hospital equipment. And we all know that properly done donation require considerable amount of time and effort. Challenges include finding the trusted and reputable recipient uh, and completing the, completing the transaction transparently efficiently and properly. Ocean's goal is to help for this. Simply put, Ocean is an exclusive online platform to connect healthcare organizations with verified recipients. Unlike Twitter's verified, by the way, Ocean team reviews each applicant and certifies the registration as donor for recipients. Uh, also, um, did I mention that it is free for both donors and recipients? Um, before switching to, okay, sorry. Um, Ocean is neither a donor nor a recipient. As I mentioned, uh, it is a platform enabling donations. Doesn't get involved with the actual donation transactions. We may say that Ocean is an exclusive and focused Kijiji for medical equipment and furniture. And uh, like a transparent tender platform, hospitals will have the ability to offer their surplus equipment and donate them to the trusted organization, which is suitable for their own criteria. The goal is to create exclusive trusted network for healthcare facilities and trusted recipients. Usually when hospitals acquire new equipment and furniture, the priority is to get the new equipment implemented and remove the old equipment efficiently. We don't have the storage. Storage is a premium in the healthcare facilities. We all know that. And uh, at that last moment, if we didn't make already connections and plan for it, uh, we need a recipient at that moment and they need, the, they need to come and pick up the items as fast as possible. So, from recipients' perspectives, uh, potential recipients really appreciate the, the knowledge of available equipment for donations. And Ocean's goal is to fill the need for both hospitals and recipients, one-stop shop for all. So what you're seeing here is the uh, after the recipients log in, they see the screen. Um, by the way, there are currently 27 verified and registered donor and recipient organizations. And um, I think Ocean team rejected seven applications um, because they didn't fit into the, our criteria uh, as experienced not-for-profit uh, or hospital uh, criteria within that. Uh, and as early, uh, I mentioned earlier, this review process really maintains the exclusive trusted and verified platform for all Ocean users so that they don't have to worry about that aspect of the transaction. We have several categories in the available items and uh, the donors, oh, sorry, recipient can click one of them. And when, for example, when the recipient clicks the electromedical equipment, they get to see whatever available at that moment and they can dig deep, uh, click the pictures and see the information posted by the donors and then have the ability to contact the donors and provide their intention to pick them up uh, and either donate them to third world countries uh, um, and or, or sometimes the recipient could be a hospital who wants to use them as spare parts. Um, so, 
Ocean is not just limited to donations, by the way. It's open to the hospitals sharing their um, surplus equipment for parts as its purposes or even sell them. Uh, this is what the um, donors see. And as you see um, from the picture, uh, it kind of looks like a Kijiji. It's an it's, uh, uh, e-commerce product uh, offered from a company called Salacious. Salacious. We simply customize it for Ocean's uh, um, use. And so you will see some terminology um, towards selling, buying items online um, and um, posting from the donor perspective is quite easy. Uh, you just fill a few fields, uh, mandatory fields, and you can put as many pictures as you like. You can even put a fee if you want to sell the equipment, uh, considering you're from a hospital or you're complying with the uh, regulatory requirements as uh, indicated by Sarah's presentation. And then um, the potential recipients will see what's available. They will get in contact with you. Uh, since they are all trusted and verified, you can uh, very comfortably communicate and proceed to the transaction. Uh, despite its small budget and limited resources, Ocean is up and running, ready to serve Canadian and global healthcare. Ocean is still in infancy stages, by the way. And I believe our timing has been a bit unfortunate considering the pandemic. So the utilization of the platform is very low at the moment. Uh, we hope it will eventually pick up if there is actually a need that Ocean effectively fulfills. And that takes me to the last slide. And looking at the time, I think we have more than enough time for questions. I ended up going through really fast to, through my slides. Um, these are the contact information of the, um, the presenters of the session, as well as the organization information, including CMBS, CISO, and OCEAN. So we can switch to questions and Q&A. Um, Bill, back to you. Okay, thanks, Murat. Um, we have some questions in the um, Q and A, and so maybe the panel can all turn on their cameras and microphones because we may need feedback from everybody on these. Oh yeah. But um, so the first one, Anders Engstrom. Hello, Anders. Anders, nice to hear from you. Um, his question: In my experience, working in lower resource countries and issues with donations, number one. North American 110 volts, as essentially all recipients are 220 volts. Solution, convert to 220 volts before sending. That's, um, and be aware of the voltage of the country you're sending it to. Um, a very good point. There's a lot of equipment goes up in smoke because it's been sent to a country without paying attention to the voltage. Number two, um, Pumps such as dialysis pumps or infusion pumps use disposables that are in most cases not available in the recipient country. Yeah, this is a big problem with infusion pumps that the way the um, manufacturers make their money is on selling the consumables that go with it. Lower resource countries can't afford those consumables. So an infusion pump should only be sent if it can use a, a generic infusion set. Number three, send user manuals. Well, yes, exactly. We already all agreed with that. Uh, second question, I'll throw this over to Sarah, perhaps. When the recipient institution is not in Canada, does the, does the hospital need a distributor license? Okay, so um, based on our group's understanding, the requirements of whether the recipient institution is in Canada or outside of Canada, the Health Canada requirements are the same, which is that the hospital does not need an establishment license, but the hospital does need to comply with the requirements of being a distributor, which are to uh, track where the equipment goes, be able to forward any alert and recall information, and also be able to accept 
uh, problem reports and deal with them and, and document that process. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Sarah. Um, third question from Martin. Uh, do you think Health Canada classifies the donation of parts for medical technology? Um, boy, that's an interesting question. I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Um, I think they're only interested in devices that are actually licensed. So I would add, I guess it depends if the part is considered a device or if it's just a repair part. Like if the part is in fact an accessory that holds a device license, then I think Health Canada would consider that as the donation of a medical device. But I'm not sure if it's a repair part, how they regard that. Yeah, I think we need somebody from Health Canada to answer that question. That's an uh, interesting question. Um, I, I would agree with uh, Sarah's um, interpretation, though I haven't seen any uh, mention of parts in the medical device regulations. Mm -hmm. Next, let's go to the next question. Um, from Jennifer McGill, has there been success getting shipping covered by recipients of donations? That's um, that's an interesting question because the shipping costs are often a considerable fraction of the total value of the, uh, the shipment. Like a, a shipping container to send um, across the ocean, I think, the costs are around ten thousand uh, dollars. Recipient countries typically don't have that kind of money. Um, I'm not aware of anyone. Perhaps if you've anyone in the audience has information on that, they could put it in the comments. But um, in most cases, charities who are donating equipment overseas, their biggest challenge is is funding the shipping costs. Uh, because the recipients, in most cases, could not possibly pay for those costs. Question from Martin. Has anyone in Canada set up a process for distribution record tracking? Marat, I don't know. Maybe you could try and tackle that one. It's a bit like ocean, but not quite. Um, unfortunately, I haven't heard uh, anyone trying to tackle with that. I don't know uh, um, other than knowing centrally what would that really help to. Uh, having said that, if one day our vision is if Ocean becomes a widely used network, the information will be readily available for the member hospitals or healthcare uh, members of the Ocean. Uh, but at the moment, I'm not aware of such a um, set up. I right. think and, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, sir. I was going to say, depending on the um, the way that the um, hospital CMMS is set up, um, there could be ways to kind of utilize that same function, but potentially set up. Um, donors as other sites or properties within the organization and, st and still track the location of medical equipment in the same way uh, that we do for internal equipment. I haven't done it myself, so maybe that's an overly simplistic view, but also in terms of distributing alerts and recalls, we do that throughout our organizations. So again, depending on how the system is set up, it could just be another layer of uh, distribution kind of beyond the hospital campus. Um, if if the question was around that, I agree, Sarah. I from uh, for the donations that we do uh, from my hospital, we do mark the asset information uh, with the uh, recipient and and the where it's donated to, so we can, if ever need to, uh, keep uh, communicating the alerts, recalls, or manufacturer information, just to fulfill that obligation as a distributor.
Next question, do you know of any hospitals that have complied with the requirements of becoming a distributor? Um, the requirements to become a you don't need the establishment license, so that's the first thing. Um, but beyond that, um, as we've discussed before, it, most of the requirements can be um, met by keeping the data in your CMMS um, and just regarding the recipient as another site so that they would receive um, any notifications um, about that equipment. Uh, Sarah or Murat, other comments on that? I agree. I think it's uh, with this presentation, we're trying to raise the awareness that uh, uh, for hospitals, since you don't need establishment license, all you need to do is uh, don't delete the asset records and make sure the alert recall distribution, if ever happens for those items, uh, fill, fill, you know, or happens as usual with the rest of your assets and you communicate the information with the area that you distributed to. Now, having said that, the question I can't answer and I don't know what happens if you donated that equipment through a charity to a third world country. I don't think mm -hmm. you need to distribute that alert or recall information or manufacturer letter to outside the country. Uh, it should be within the Canada, that's my interpretation, but we need to find out actual answer from out Canada, I guess. Thanks, Murat. Then um, Jennifer's got a follow up question. Who covers that cost then? And um, there was actually an answer in the chat to that. Um, I'll just read that off because Dawit. Um, makes the comment, we used GoFundMe to get the public in the community to cover his shipping cost on our last donation a year ago. There is a charity in British Columbia called Rotary World Help that does a lot of shipping overseas, and they use their own fundraising um, mechanisms to fund all of their shipping containers. They sh ship quite a few shipping containers every year. Um, so it, it is a significant cost. Um, Parisa says she has a case where a recipient paid for the shipment. That's quite unusual, but it, I guess that's an example that proves that it, it, it uh, can happen in some cases. Mario has a good question here. Is there some consideration to get free storage area where we could send the equipment to be donated? Our hospital keeps asking us to get rid of the unused equipment. Yeah, storage space is very tight. Um, Murat, do you want to try and pick up on that? Yes, uh, I I think that would be wonderful. I totally agree with Mario. And uh, But how I see that happening at this moment, there is no initiative. This is a a uh, more centralized uh, governmental practice, almost like the similar program in Quebec, uh, where uh, government collects the um, donatable, usable surplus equipment from hospitals and uh, coordinate accordingly. Um, maybe one day, if again, ocean picks up, uh, and if there is a need, uh, we plan to uh, collaborate with Ontario government uh, towards that direction. At the moment, I'm not aware of any other province other than Quebec doing that kind of service and coordination. Thanks, Marat. Um, let's move on we've got a couple more minutes um martin makes a comment maintaining distribution records and expecting our old slash out of support technology to be licensed are barriers to donate under the regulations um that is a requirement under the regulations that 
you must, um, you should not be, uh, quote, selling anything that doesn't have a medical device license from Health Canada. And if the manufacturers let the license expire, Strictly speaking, you should no longer be donating that device. Um, Morat, over to you. Oh, sorry, I clicked the link um, button by mistake, Bill. <laughs> You're answering it already, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, I didn't know there was a, uh, right, oh, answer live button, yes, I see. And Anders comments, most recipients don't have a data entry system where they can track the equipment in their country. Um, Good point. Uh, once it arrives in a low resource country, there may be no records kept as to which hospital it ends up in. Rosanna, um, welcome, glad you could join us. In low income settings, some taxes and costs of shipping are not applied or to reduced if an academic organization is engaged, engaged in the use of the donation. So the recipient if the recipients, as I understand it, is an academic organization, they may be hit with local taxes, um, import duties. Um, that's, that's a serious problem. We don't, um, and donors, again, would be unaware of the, um, the tax and, and duty implications of in the recipient country unless they have very good communication with the recipients because obviously the donors are much better able to assist with those costs than the local academic organization i uh, i think the answer is to make sure you got good communication with the donor and explain to them all the costs that their donation is going to incur once it lands in your country because it may be uh, significant, and it may prevent the use of the equipment. Um, but thank you for that comment, Rosanna. Uh, Bassett, any plans to consider user or BMET training? Hmm. Morat, do you want to try and pick that up? Um, yeah, I don't, I haven't heard any specific plans uh, for, um, including that in in the ocean i'm just from ocean perspective um answering that it's uh, it's not in the works um we're running over i think we we'll just try and tackle one more question the, the um, if i may suggest kevin's question uh is interesting and clarifying one uh Mm -hmm. about uh he says uh, so if we donate it to an ngo that distributes to unknown other locations we would then need to only send the recalls to that ngo and the expectation on them would be to forward that from hospital perspective since you distributed the equipment to the ngo uh that would be correct that would satisfy your requirements for the, as a distributor Would you agree, Sarah? Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. And there's a quick one here from Krita. Is there any concern if the license of the device becomes not active after the donation? Um, nope. I think we're, nope. yeah, no. The device license is an issue at the point of sale. So if, um, if, once the donation changes, or, or once the device changes ownership, um, the device license could um, expire the next day. That wouldn't affect the hospital's um, obligation because they would have maintained that the device was in place at the time of uh, change in ownership. And and just to think of the example of the hospitals, hospitals, many hospitals are using devices well past their expected lifetime. Um, and they've no longer covered by license and hospitals continue to use them. So it's it's the same situation. I'm afraid we're gonna have to wrap it up there. Perhaps we can um, keep track of this 
quite a stack of questions still coming in. Um, we'll try and answer these offline. Um, so um, uh, we'll figure out how to distribute them to the registrants. And um, thank you all for attending the webinar. That's been great and wonderful to see so much um, interest in the topic from Canada and outside the country. So thanks everybody and bye for now.